see multiple identities. Yeah, identity mm -hmm. in India and interface. <clears throat> the the let me begin with one or two questions. How do you construct your own identity? What constitutes the identity as such? But before that, one you need to understand how do you construct your identity? Do you construct your identity vis-a-vis -vis others? And what are the factors that made you to construct your identity in Indian context or the, at the national, I mean, global level as such? The third important thing is that um, can a person have uh, has got multiple identities? Can you have multiple identities? And which identity becomes most dominant in Indian context or in the context of uh, transformation taking place? <coughs> third important thing is that uh, how do you get um, identities competing with each other in Indian politics. In what way they are representing these identities? Or how these identities have been articulated in Indian context? And what is the consequence of such identities in Indian politics as such? You know, in fact, um, let me begin with the theoretical deb debate. One debate was that um, identity, very identity argument is brought against the Marxist understanding about the class. Because the argument was that um, <coughs> too much of a class has distorted the existence of multiple categories existing within a class. Now, for example, take the case of the peasantry. How do you differentiate between a peasantry or what are the differences within the peasantry? The argument is that there are multiple categories. The poor peasantry, middle middle peasantry, upper uh, upper class peasantry, rich peasantry, or what Daniel Thorner calls, you know, uh, Kisan, Mazdu, and Malik. These three are the categories. They they would say that look, Malik is not only the category but also an identity marker. The Malik is basically trying to control the land physically or as a matter of gentleman farming. <coughs> it's nothing but absently, absently, absentee landlordism. So it came as a counter to the Maxine argument of class. And this came as a part of the liberal discourse. Identity matters came as a part of the liberal discourse. So it led to the what is called the identitarian politics as such. But in fact, the other, other kind of argument was that even within the identities, there are class. So in other words, they are trying to say that there are overlapping categories. And, and uh, you, even if they are overlapping, but also they are representing different identities. In other words, there's an argument, inbuilt argument saying that the class exists within this identities also. For example, when you say that peasant as an identity marker, identity, right? Peasant as a homogeneous category. But when you look at this category called the rich peasantry, rich peasantry itself is a class. They might have been talking about the identities as such, but they are the class. 
so in other words class is inbuilt even in the the argument about the identity what does it mean does it mean simply that the, this a liberal discourse talks about the identity alone i would say that no even the marxist they also talk about like for example when you look at the the uh, the marxist theory of feminism marxist theory of feminism or the gender gender or the feminism is when an identity issue women's issue gender issue for example if we take the cases of the kind of social exploitation or or the argument about the what is called the feminization of the labor so take the case of the you know uh, reserved army argument about this reserved army where women becomes you know dominant force or the feminization of the workforce feminization of the corruption or issues about the you know you have got the sexual abuses rape and other things it was seen as the effect is a seen as an attack on the the identities of the women what happened to the women's identities in the workforce will they be understood as a you know different category altogether or will they be categorized as one among the thousands of categories the marxists would also use the term here the social exploitation but when you talk about the identities marxism also in once here liberal it is not simply the liberal project that's an important thing all identities are not a simply liberal project but also is a marxist project so in other words identity can be class identity can be transformed into class category and the class can be transformed into identities and and at the same time even though it's an western project it just basically came from the western world particularly american world when the black movement came up feminist movement came up all these things they started talking about recognizing their identities the whole question becomes important who has to recognize your identity and secondly how do you construct your identity look at the argument of uh, uh, charles taylor charles taylor in his book on the politics of recognition argues that if the category is if the you know if the identities are not been recognized through by the state or by the system they will be marginalized they will be pushed again and again to the corner for example if i don't recognize you as teachers because you are actually working as teachers imagine suppose if i recognize you as laborers what will happen is nothing but a kind of suppression of the categories suppression of the teachers and trying to relook them as laborers is nothing but again victimizing 
suppressing social categories. And identities are not created in vacuum. That has to be you know, highlighted here. Identity issues emerged in a particular context of history. In India also, they, it, they emerged in Indian context of a particular history. Even though, even though we started using the as against the victimization of the women or the victimization of the natives or the destruction of the ecology or the nuclear growth of the countries or it also emerged in the context of the climate change. The host of issues that was that were responsible for the growth of the identity politics. Although it all began in the First World War, much before the First World War, but it emerged in different levels. Indian context, even though we started talking about the identity politics after. 1980s, I would say, as a result of multiple social movements, whether the feminist movement or the Dalit movement or the farmers movement, tribal movements, ecology movements, or when the issues of the farmer suicide came up, or the issues of the displacement of the tribals they came up, or the issues of uh, uh, what's called the construction of big dams and all came up. They came up at a time when <coughs> political regime, so the political system was becoming more powerful. Even the political system would say that, they were all, the political system itself was very soft. Yeah, the soft has a different connotation. But it also came at a time when the caste politics becoming very, very strong in Indian context, particularly after the 1780s, sorry, 1980s. which Rajni Kothari calls it as politicization of the caste. I'll come back to that argument a little later. But we need to understand how these identity politics in Indian context in the Western world were constructed. In fact, identity politics or the identity issues were constructed both from within and without. or within and outside in relation to others. This happened in the case of India also. But at the same time, it also led to a kind of confusion. Where to find out the, where do you demarcate the line between the one identity and the other identity? Before that, I don't know, I mean, we need to understand why this was constructed, why the identity became a source of contestation, a source of construction. We would call it as a political construction as well as well as a social construction. You know, social categories, in a given situation, they try to construct the identities vis-a-vis -vis the others. vis-a-vis -vis the other social categories. It is not the identities are not constructed in absence, in abstract, 
or even in, in, in a very ambiguous manner. They are constructed against others, pitting others. The others is nothing but the state, nothing but the social categories, nothing but the you know hold over the power structure and other things. Look at the argument in the reservation in Indian context. For example, <clears throat> communities would, whether it's a Panjabanshali, Chapar Bandis, Gurubas, and others, their argument is that look, we are not represented according to the population. And, and we, we are different from others. We, we need to be shifted to the uh, other categories. For example, Kurubas would say that we should be you know, shifted to the SC categories. Remember, Chappar Bandis also argue that we need to be changed to SC categories. I know it's not been in conformity with the uh, you know, total population. No, this is an old argument. For example, during the time of uh, old Mysore state, a couple of people, they demanded that, uh, that the representation should be given in accordance with the total population of the community. They would also put the argument against others. <clears throat> For example, uh, like uh, Okaligas might argue about against the Lingas in terms of the population. Look at the Kantraj Committee report. If it comes to open, probably it might open up a Pandora box. Dalis will, you know, will be taking the first place, replacing the Lingas, followed by the Muslims and the Kurubas and others. The argument will spill over to the issue about <coughs> <coughs> that Dalits, their percentage is, has increased over the Lingas, so they should be given the representation more. If we don't give the representation, percentage according to the population, then obviously it might lead to some kind of conflictual situation. So one is that it is constructed vis-a-vis -vis others against the state. Others means here the state also involved. Why state is not giving? representation. Why state is not recognizing this caste? Second, this process of what's called identity is nothing but othering the, othering the communities. <coughs> For example, in pitting the argument, they would say that, no, you are all others. They're not a part of us. For example, like the whole debate that took place in the Lingat uh, and Virashivas a couple of years back, when the Lingas were saying that um, uh, we represent the true Lingat movement or the Lingat religion, we're not Virashivas. Virashivas were constructed as others within the Lingat movement. So it's nothing but the othering. You are not us, you are outsiders. This is the second important phenomenon. When you're constructing, the third important factor is the 
issues of victim, victimization, or the victimhood. For example, there are two kinds of things. One is the contemporary period, the victimization in the contemporary period. Second is the victimization historically, looking at the historical evolution of the deprivation, historical evolution of the, <clears throat> what's called the victimization. For example, these arguments are very quite apparent. For example, among the Muslims, it's quite happened. Or take any categories, like for example, the peasantry. They've been saying that historically we have been denied. Historically, we have been victim of the state, whether the colonial or the post-colonial. Historically, we became the victim of developmental paradigms of the state. So victimhood card is the most important that's been used by the identity makers. There's a third important thing is that, you know, there's an agency, identity maker or maker of this identity is backed by an agency. Who speaks, for example, agency is nothing but a, a, a person, an association who would speak on behalf of these identities. <clears throat> like earlier, we had one agency, I would call it the Indian National Agency, International Congress as an agency to speak on behalf of everybody, including the peasantry, tribals women, minorities, and everybody. But in the caste politics also, given the fact that there are hundreds of associations which have evolved over the years, take the case of 1920s in old Mysore. There are Vokaligara Sangha, Lingayat Education Society, Central Muslim, uh, Mohammedan Central, Central Mohammedan Association, Arya Samajab Association. All these associations, I would call them as agencies. They're all articulating on behalf of the communities. For example, during the colonial period, they would ask for the more representation. They would ask for schools. They would ask for the change in the nomenclature of the caste at the time of the census reports. They would ask for free ships or hostels. They also ask for some place, some representation in different committees or the commissions. You know, you are the colonial period, you are the Indian National Congress, as I said earlier. We are the caste association talking about the identities. Today, look at the, the caste associations talking about <coughs> where the, the, the Swamiji's have become the agencies of some of the caste. Try to articulate on behalf of the community. Mata has become the agencies of the identity issues. Associations have become the agencies of the identities. Even political parties have become the agencies of the identities. Look at, it's largely presumed that uh, uh, JDS in Karnataka, or Lokdal in Uttar Pradesh, were representing the interest of the peasant classes. Or to be precise about the caste, 
Lokdal was articulating the interest of identities of judge. JDS is creating So then it is argued that the identity, the articulation of the identities requires these agencies. Otherwise, it's difficult to articulate. And identities while talking about while constructing their you know, specific place, they also argue the issues about the deprivation, deprivation, not only the victimization. This is apparent in the case of many things. Deprivation of the benefit of the development. For example, this is apparent in the case of the Kurg movement. Kurk Kodagu in Karnataka he is one of the highly developed districts in Karnataka. It's basically coffee growing area. Human development index is very high. But it also suffers from the notion of deprivation. That's a strange but also paradoxical. How do you look at uh, a region when it's prosperous, when, I, when, when, when its economy is linked to the, not only the national economy, but also the global economy? For example, the coffee prices are determined in the in New York Stock Exchange. And the most richest people are living in Kurk. But at the same time, why Kurk is suffering from the idea of deprivation? Not the syndrome, but the idea of deprivation. Then and then how this has translated into a separatist movement. <coughs> One side of Prosperity has led to this notion about deprivation. The argument is that Kurg is highly rich in resources, particular coffee resources, and providing huge amount of money to the state exchequer. But at the same time, Kurg is also deprived of the basic necessities. For example, the roads hospitals, hospitals, buses, educational institutions, which form the basic necessities of people, but they're all deprived in Kurk. Imagine in history, for the first time, they're going to have one university this year. Couple of years back, it witnessed one engineering college. They don't have the pharmacy college or high educational institutions. So look at this identity issue. That's the reason why they say that we need to protect our identity as Kurgis. There are two kinds of argument. One is the political identity which they lost it after the, after the amalgamation of the Kurg region, which was once an independent state, sea state, which was merged with the Mysore, 1950s, or the 1940s and 50s somewhere. But there are attempts in 1936 also. Its political identity was completely erased. Or its political identity was completely merged with the Karnataka identity. Initially with the Mysore identity, later on the Karnataka identity. 
Second identity issue that came up along with that one was that <clears throat> the identities of the Kurgis is under threat, given the fact that the, the integration of the state has <coughs> allowed everybody, anybody, for example, anybody to live in, in Kur. That's the reason why Kurgis are becoming minorities within their own state. Probably these kind of arguments have been made in the case of the Jammu and Kashmir, particularly in the Kashmir. So I, one is the social identity. They're slowly losing it. And the communitarian identity, that they're, they're you know, full, full, you know, powerfully losing it in the everyday life practices. Even this argument is being made in the case of the tribals. <coughs> this is the reason why historically they revolted against the outsiders, known as the dikus. Outsiders would come there to the tribal land and buy the land and displaces this category, tribals. The tribal lands are basically, you know, is a land of natural resources. For example, the resources like natural resources like nickel, iron, magnesium. Others are available plenty in their land, on their land. So what happened is that when the land was encroached upon by the outsiders, when the land was converted into private land by the Britishers, or the land was privatized. For example, or the natural resources were privatized, like the, for example, Shivna Tribu was privatized. When the river water was privatized, tribals lost their identity as autonomous categories. They lost the water for their irrigation. They lost the water for catching the fish. They, they lost the water for cultivating lands. So what happened is that their identities as tribals came under threat. That's the reason why historically it is, they revolted against outsiders. They revolted against the state also. For example, they revolted against the state because you know that state used their land for the purpose of the development. It constructed dams for their lands. It constructed what's called you know, electricity, I mean, yeah, electric power stations. It constructed their lands for the purpose of the or use their lands for the purpose of the national highways. <clears throat> it constructed the industrialist. And in the process, when the, when the state encroached upon their land, so obviously they revolted. Similar case in the case of the coup. Kirk, even though they were not revolting, but they were agitating <coughs> to reclaim their historical identities, like the social and the political identities. Or they take the case of the tribals in the matters of uh, leasing out their land to the 
big industrialist. For example, in the case of the Orissa, where the Vedanta company, Erical company, is trying to take over the land of the tables in the Nyamgiri area. As I said earlier, as I said earlier, <coughs> tables lands were rich in natural resources. In fact, uh, statistics say that nearly 85% of the tribal's lands were located on the natural resources. So displacement was becoming inevitable because forced upon by the companies. Even the state has also resorted to displacing the tables. For example, through the means of the public policy. One public policy is Wildlife Act, Wildlife Act. Or the other, the oldest public policy is I think the Land Acquisition Act of 1853. That act is still used in Indian context with the two amendments in recent years. They were using that historical laws to displace the tables. So that's the reason why there's a consistent opposition against the state, which might have taken the radical, you know, agitational form, or against the multinational corporations because they are the, the foreign agencies. And also against the outsiders. So they were agitating against three, the outsiders, state, and the foreigners, foreign companies. In the case of the coup, and here the identity issue is the most important because once the tribals loses their land, then obviously that will transform them into non-tribal category. But there is a difference, there is a catch here. Catch is about the two issues. One is that whether the tribals will retain their identity as tribals even though they have been converted to different religion, including the Christianity and the Hinduism. It's a long drawn process. That from the beginning of the 18th century, huge number of tribals, either they were converted to the Christianity or they became part of the Hindu social order. In that particular context, even after the conversion, even after they've been identified as the Hindus, what will happen to their identity markers? Will they remain as tribals? Or will they remain, will they be transformed into completely into Christians? Take the case of the Birsa Mundari vote. <clears throat> but some under revolt in history, or even take the case of the Jharkhand movement or Nyamgiri movement, or, or uh, you have got other movements, Munda movement, Birsa Munda movement, Santal movement, and other movements. Birsa Munda movement was not only against the Christian propagation, but also against the, the colonial forces. Even after the conversion, he always believed that he was a tribal first. 
So he, he retained the tribal identity. You know, tribal identity, sometimes what happens is that it becomes an admixture of different cultural practices. For example, there was a time when somebody went to a tribal area and asked for this, what is called the tribal culture should be shown. They started dancing. In fact, the dancing was nothing but disco dancing. It was not the tribal dancing, which they said that it's tribal dancing. What I'm trying to say that look at your identities when it did transform. Sometimes they become very difficult to demarcate. So they take the case of the tribals and the peasantry. People like A.R. Desai, a sociologist, well-known sociologist, argue that the tribals are nothing but the peasants. Particularly, the tribals who have settled down in a particular area, not those who believed in or carrying the profession of junk cultivation. Junk cultivation is nothing but the, you know, burning a uh, particular area, then moving on to the other area. See, argument is that two identities in the midst of a person living in the context of two identities, like the teachers, you're going to have multiple identities. Like, for example, we are teachers. We are, you know, belong to a different religion. We belong to different caste. We belong to different reg regions. We, within the regions, we belong to a different setup. Like this question was asked to Khan Abdullah Ghaffar Khan, Bwadu Gandhi. Once, what is your identity? He said, thousand years back, I was a tribe. Then I became an Aryan. Then I became an Afghani. Then I became a Muslim. Then I became a Pathan. Then he said, in the midst of multiple identities, which exactly is my identity? Can you identify? Or take the case of me. I'm trying to explain it from. I am from a rural area called the Shirua in Udbi Talu. I speak Tulu language. I speak Urdu language. I got two multiple identities, a Tuluwa and a non-Tuluwa. And then you have got an identity like the, you know, Old Mysore, white Madrasi, and then Kannadi identity. So you got multiple identities. So demarcating one identity becomes very difficult. The peasantry and the tribal. How do you contextualize? How, how do you differentiate? Because the land is the common denominator. There should be some common denominator. denominator to call the peasantry as the tribes. In fact, that's the reason why they become overlapping categories. Because there's a commonality. For example, the land becomes a commonality for tribals as well as the peasantry. And the social exploitation becomes a common factor. Or exploitation of the categories became a, you know, important factor. So the question is about the identity, and that's at the same time this identity transform in the context into a broader identity. So look at, for example, this identity. I would say that look at there's one caste. There are hundreds of subcasts. 
For example, you got, uh, I think in Karnataka, there are nearly 50 tribes. Oh, cultural madake. since this caste, some caste, you know, there are people who said that there is no category called the sub caste, they all belong to one caste. But they cost you to be free to census reports of 1921 and 1931. Many castes claim the status of the higher caste or microscopic caste also demanded higher status. So the, uh, that's the reason why you have got multiple identities emerging within the same caste. You've got a, one side, you've got a, you know, amorphous caste agree. For example, like the Vakaligas. Vakaligas says, is a single basket. Within that basket, you have got not less than 100 caste. Each caste would try to demand something else, both from within and outside. So they, they compete with each other. These castes compete with each other. Or subcast compete with each other to claim the benefits of the larger identity. There are times when the identities try to shift their framework to the other category so that they'll get the social benefit. You know, the, you come across these things in the 1920s and the 1930s. Even though that time the issues about the identity was not debated much, but it was quite apparent, even though in the, both in the colonial census reports or uh, colonial, um, uh, you know, gazetteers and other things. But one thing they made a very bad mistake was that they created new and new identities, new and new categories, <coughs> which are basically trying to project social, social categories in a bad you know, shape. For example, colonialism constructed a category called um, criminal tribes. By virtue of profession, functions, occupations. Like, for example, Chaparbandis, Kallo. These are the small communities. They were branded as the criminals just because one family member was involved in you know, this criminal activity. The whole community was castigated and branded. And then this branding remained in force. Even now also, you know that some of the castes are called as ex-criminal tribes, nomadic tribes, ex-nomadic tribes. Why do you want to use these categories? Ex-nomadic tribes, ex-criminal. You know, I mean, which obviously means that you are agreeing to the fact that they were once criminals. The moment you say that you are an ex-criminal, probably that will affect the social positioning of the caste, social positioning of the communities. Like for example, colonial writings, now that kind of stereotyping is still very strong with regard to a category called the Mapulas. Right from the beginning, 1871, they were castigated as most arrogant, most violent, most conservative, 
all this kind of categories. Now also this, that perception still holds good. So there's a danger while you are categorizing the, you know, when you are identifying the categories and providing them the identities, it might lead to the, what's called the victimization, the categories. They become the victims, the identity of Maplas, or identity of the Nawaz, identity of the Labbas, that they, they escaped from. They are not Indians, they're all escaped from the Iraq. Will always become a negative factor in the politics. The second important thing is that, and, and the whole debate is that, whether the identity markers require any recognition. Any identity markers require any state support. And how state would recognize the identities of the categories? It is done through different you know, forms, different ways. One of the important forms is the, what is called the affirmative action, or which is also called as the reservation policy. You know, reservation policy, in fact, covers 100% of the population, even though reservation is restricted to 50%. And uh, <clears throat> this has led to the deep crisis. You know, state provides, st state recognizes. Look, this caste requires the reservation of this percentage. 15 or 17 percent for the SCSTs. Or 4 percent for the Muslims. This is the way State recognizes the categories. And secondly, it recognizes through the enlisting the social categories. Look at the Backward Class Commission reports. This committee report, commission report, enlisted hundreds of caste. You, you know, that's the reason why every caste is getting the you know, policy results. If they are not enlisted, then obviously they'll be deprived of the state resources, policies, and other things. Wait a minute, I think uh, my battery is draining out. One minute. So the state resources, that's even the state needs to recognize their very presence. If not, as I said earlier, they would be marginalized. They would be completely marginalized in the political apparatus. That's the reason why the identities of the caste, they, it will be suffered. or it will suffer a lot. That's the reason why when you look at these identity issues, and the most important thing is that, um, you know, you, the state, I mean, the,
Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Um, that's the reason why in the identity politics, we require to have the politics of recognition. Otherwise the communities will be marginalizing. Indian context, the whole debate has taken place in this background. Now there's one issue that's literally bothering me also. For example, like the, how to look at the identity issues in the context of the post globalization phase, particularly with reference to the society of the large number of farmers in Indian context. So it is true that you know the farmers in Indian context are committing suicide. Tribals are losing their lands. Dalits are being marginalized. Muslims are being marginalized. But how do you look at the growing suicide of the farmers? Was there any issues of the identities? And at the same time, how do you how these identities have been articulated in Indian context. One is that, as I said earlier, that the identities have been articulated through the, one is the agency, whether it's in associations, caste associations, or the leaders. Gandhi was the agency of everybody during the nationalist movement. Congress was the agency of everybody. Then you've got JP coming in. But there are social movements which have become the agencies of the, what is called the, this articulating, you know, social, I mean, they have become the agencies of the communities, not the religious communities, social communities, like the peasantry, the tribals, women, or even ecology. Ecology per se will not speak, but it's true that there is the inbuilt argument of loss of ecology will nothing but the loss of livelihood. Loss of livelihood obviously means the loss of community life. Loss of community life means, love, means the loss of individuals, loss of social life. So it all inter integrated or interlinked. Similar case is the issues about the climate change. Climate change is not simply the use of, you know, or reducing the, you know, it's carbon issues, but much more. It is an issue about the livelihood. It's an issues about the existence of the people. So it becomes a very difficult narrative. Look at the argument of the peasantry, the farmers. Farmers have been arguing that their identities as farmers will not hold good in the context of the globalization. They've been dying. They're all committing suicide because the globalization is creating volatile economy and they are not being able to pay the debts. Their intellectual properties have been appropriated with the global capital. Their you know, social life has been hampered by the intervention of the uh, global capital. And their identities as farmers is fast losing. So to preserve, to remain themselves as the farmers, they would commit suicide. It was reaction to, to the global capital. 
and its attendant effect has caused them to commit suicide. And the whole issue is about the retaining their identity. And at the same time, the loss of their identity. An Indian context. <clears throat> Similar case in the context of the women. <coughs> Globalization has transformed them into commodities. And it has also transformed them, women, into what is called foot loose soldiers. They're being you know, emerged as something else other than women. So their identities are fast I mean, losing. So that takes they, they, their the issues about the identity becomes is articulated through the movements, <coughs> social movements. Now, for example, new and new categories are entering into these social movements. Like, for example, LT, uh, uh, say, gays, LGBTs, women, tribals, Muslim women. Dalit women, Adivasi women, farmers, those who are protecting the environment, they also take the cause of the feminism. They are trying to link up the you know, ecology and the feminism or the women. So got hundreds and hundreds of movements are emerging in Indian context as against the loss of identities, as against the loss of the cultural practices, as against the practice of everyday life. So it's, it's a situation where you have got these one contradictions taking place, severe contradictions. Second, these contradictions are taking the very antagonistic form. This third is that these contradictions are translating into conflictual forms. Fourth is that these contradictions are taking the form of dialogue or, or, or also they are taking the form of dissenting voices. They're also taking the forms of cultural practice, cultural issues. For example, now global capital coming into a household. One thing is that the globalization and the modernity has completely destroyed the joint family. Now you've got a nuclear family. Now, secondly, it has created what is called the dependent economies. Families are now depending upon the market. Market simply has come down to your place, to your home. There is no nothing called the fixed market now. Fixed areas called the markets. Now market has collapsed. Concept of market has collapsed. Everybody is linked to the market through the agencies, like for example, Amazon, Zomatos, Flipkarts. They have brought new forms of market into the, your bedroom. Your identity as self-made, self-sufficient, self-sustaining has been lost. Now, the identities as parents, identities as, you know, godfathers or whatever it may be, it's being lost. <coughs> so it's, th this kind of transformation has literally changed the social life and the social scape. Social escape has completely changed. Now, 
different scapes are entering into your domain. Media scape is covering you. Media, whether the social media, it becomes a part of your everyday narratives. Or finance media, finance scape is entering your bedroom or by entering your household. Is no more disconnected. You are no more disconnected from the financial sectors. Bank is coming to your home. Loans are coming to your home. Now, as a independent, as a person who can go to the market, who can move to the market or to the banks and other things, that identity as a person who interacts with the people is slowly being collapsed. Now, for example, in Mysore and the Bangalore, person, there are houses where they would not know their own neighbors who lives there. You know, such a way, such a tendency has developed in Indian context. It is true case in the Delhi, even in Mysore also. When I'm talking right now, even I, I, I do not know who is my next neighbor who is coming there as a, you know, as, as part of that household or as a part of the rentier. So what happened is that our identities are undergoing transformation and our identity is, and identity politics is giving rise to severe crisis because of the intervention of the global capital, because of the intervention of the, the market forces, because of the you know, developmental paradigms, because of the you know, uh, social factors and other things, that they are creating deep crisis, identity crisis, and leading to the uh, suicide, mass suicide, like the farmer suicide, or agitational politics, or radicalism. So unless and until we address the issue, it becomes very difficult. Identity needs to be needs to be addressed properly by the state or by the agencies. Otherwise, what happened that identity will come, I mean like identity issues which combine these class issues and also the caste communities also might haunt you, haunt everybody without any answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Asadi. Yeah. Are you Asadi? Are you Asadi? Are you Asadi? Sir, <laughs> 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I got one more talk. Right now. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank
देविदास हाँ सर ये क्लियर जॉइन है अटेडन्स अटेडन्स फीडबैक तुम कल सर फीडबैक हाँबिड्री ओके सर थैंक यू बाय एडमिन सर इज देर एनी मेसेज आर शाल वी लिव हेलो सर इज देर एनी मेसेज फ्रॉम द एडमिन साइड आर शाल वी लिव प्लीज रिस्पॉन्ड ऐन रेस्पॉन्स इला दसराज करकन सर अरुण कुमार सर मैसूर सर लीव आगे सर ओके सर लीव आगे फीडबैक हाँ फीडबैक अस्ट थैंक यू सर ओके सर थैंक यू Okay.